Hello, my name is Kees van den Doel. I'm going to be talking about uh, subsurface temperature measurement using electromagnetic waves using machine learning for enhanced oil recovery. This is work done in collaboration with Colin Stove, Michael Robinson, Gordon Stove, and we're all at ADROG. We are a company based in Edinburgh and we're specializing in deeply penetrating subsurface scans using propagating electromagnetic waves. The outline of my talk is as follows. I'll start with giving some background and motivation for this work. I'll describe our electromagnetic and borehole field measurements. I'll describe our machine learning approach to the problem. I'll show some of our results and I'll end with the discussion. So what is enhanced oil recovery? It's basically any method that improves upon the uh, old-fashioned method of drilling a hole and sucking up the oil. Uh, various methods are in use and the gains are significant. Typically 60% more oil can be extracted using any of these methods and they all are based on the same principle by which you do not place your honey in the refrigerator because it becomes very hard to, to spoon it up. So you want to decrease the viscosity and increase the mobility ratio so you can easily suck up the oil. There are several methods currently in use by industry. I mentioned gas injection, but this talk will focus on thermal methods. The idea here is similar to the honey jar uh, you want to increase the temperature to make it flow more easily. So you melt all this viscous, uh, sticky stuff and it forms a nice subsurface puddle and you stick a pipe in there and you suck it up. That's the principle. A very common method is steam injection. You stick some pipes in the subsurface and you send steam down there to heat it up. Uh, with the, uh, uh, to, to make the oil flow better. However, many things can go wrong. Uh, the steam can go the wrong direction or the, uh, the temperature profile may be incorrect or the oil may be even made to flow into the uh, competitor's oil field next door. So it's important when you apply these methods to uh, take good control of how the temperature is affected by the steam injection. And of course the best way to measure temperature is to use a thermometer. So in industry we're using uh, temperature observation wells, TOWs. They are uh, expensive because they first, yeah, first of all you have to drill a hole, then uh, to take the actual measurement you have to lower in the borehole some temperature sensor. Typical cost is uh, $5,000 for these measurements. There's of course the upfront cost of drilling and also the production, oil production has to be stopped during this measurement. For this reason typically measurements are done three to four times a year but not more. However if something goes wrong in the intervening months the cost can be very high uh, both financially and also in terms of lives because something goes wrong, um, uh, there could be a collapse or an explosion and people could get hurt. So the goal is to improve on this. We really would like to have a virtual TOW where without too much effort you can get uh, access to the subsurface temperature. So um, this is pretty much the, the full list of what we would like. We want to do no drilling we want to reconstruct or measure the subsurface temperature using only surface data. So we need some form of remote sensing. We want to measure all this without well downtime. We, the acquisition should be fast. So as a consequence, we could do more frequent monitoring. That's also affected by the cost, of course. So we want low cost per measurement. Finally, we want easy data processing. Now what I'm going to show you does not look very easy, but by easy I mean you take the measurement and 
you feed it to your uh, computer system, you press enter and out comes the temperature lock. So the actual algorithm that may be going on in the meantime may be very complicated. But difficult data processing, I mean when you have to take the data and a team of scientists has to pour over it every time and figure out how to interpret it. Let me, uh, the next uh, section I'll talk about uh, the electromagnetic data and the POW data that we have on which this study is based. So at ATROC we have a pulsed radar subsurface imaging system. So it has some similarities to ground penetrating radar, but our wave packets have much, much lower frequency. Typically uh, the low frequency uh, component that penetrates deeply is of the order of 1 to 3 megahertz. So this is a similar um, wavelength that have been used on Mars for uh, deep surface scans from space. It's usually not uh, desirable in conventional um, shallow GPR because the, of course the wavelengths are of the order of hundreds of meters so this affects your resolution. However, for deeper penetration, uh, uh, this is necessary to acquire the data from deeper down to eliminate uh, the losses. So our system is bi-static. It basically means we have uh, a, a transmitter and a receiver as separate pieces of equipment. Because of the quickness of uh, pulsed radar, we can stack a lot more than in seismic. It's, we use a standard stacking of 100,000 shots per acquisition. So acquisition is like seismic. You do a shot and you measure the returns. That way the data is electromagnetic. So this stacking really helps in the, uh, noise reduction. Um, if necessary, we can go up to a million shots. So that will give you a square root of a million, which is a thousand, factor of thousand reduction in, uh, in noise, which is quite considerable. So these uh, measurements take a few minutes per well uh, using this 100,000 uh, stack size. The ground truth data uh, we have from TOWs was acquired on two large commercial producing oil fields. First field we have access to 21 temperature wells with data and the other had 40 wells. And near the wells we acquired our electromagnetic data as well. In addition to that, we had access to a third uh, oil field on which we only measured three temperature wells with uh, accompanying electromagnetic data. I'll explain uh, later how we use this data. So the TOW data is used as ground truth and typically the, uh, the depth is rough, uh, up to which we Use TOW data is about uh, 1,400 feet, so we're talking about uh, 350, 350 meters maximum. I'll describe our machine learning approach in some detail. So the goal is to go from our electromagnetic data, which comes in the form of time series, to the temperature uh, log, which also comes in the form of a time series. So a time series is just a bunch of numbers, y versus x. So, uh, in order to uh, test this approach, uh, we divide our data set into a training, uh, training set and a test data point. So basically, if we have uh, 40 MT pairs, we train on 39 and see how well we predict the remaining one through this uh, for each of our, uh, each of our uh, data sets. So we basically have to uh, build a new neural network for every of those tests, but that's fine. The approach, uh, the direct approach of uh, correlating temperature directly with our uh, uh, radar logs is not to be recommended because the temperature data is highly structured. Therefore, we first encode the temperature using a uh, autoencoder and we predict the encoded the compressed temperature data from our electromagnetic data with a five layer feed forward neural network using a supervised learning. 
it's important not to try to encode our uh, electromagnetic data because it contains a mixture of geological information and temperature information and we don't know which is which goal of the network is to take this apart and we also use three sites from a third field which illustrate the importance of uh, having uniform geology in our set data sets for this to work well here's the structure of our autoencoder um, the measured temperature is encoded into a number of uh, neurons and then decoded and we reconstruct the original temperature with a certain de degree of accuracy so we found that uh, an encoding using five internal neurons uh, works quite well and there's some intuition behind this because the typical uh, temperature logs they look like a beginning of a hot zone and the end of a hot zone each of them characterized by temperature and a depth and some maximum uh, peak temperature so that's five numbers altogether once we have encoded all our temperature log, this is unsupervised learning, we have our feed-forward neural net and we train it on the encoded temperature as follows. We, the input uh, to the feed-forward feed -forward neural network is our uh, radar data and it's tried to predict N of T, the encoded temperature. Um, the supervised learning error is generated here in the middle to compare it to what we actually do the, the ground proof here and if we do not have this available then uh, we just have this part of the neural network and using the saved decoder we can always go from encoded to decoded temperature so just let me show you some of our results so this is the uh, uh, result of the autoencoder for uh, for the larger site with 40 data points, and this is done with five activations. So you can see that pretty much all these temperature profiles, the red ones, can be coded quite well using this. There is a few anomalies. Number 18 seems to have some problems here, uh, and the other one is this one, which in which case the autoencoder seems to have missed this small hot zone here. However, uh, consulting with, uh, with some of the uh, consulting the temperature uh, logs in some more detail, it turned out that this data, this temperature log, was actually not very reliable, and this is most likely an error. Here are the results of the the entire approach for the first test site, which had uh, 21 uh, data pairs. So the uh, the red data is the ground truth, the blue is our prediction. These are all blind tests. The depth is in feet, the temperature is in Fahrenheit. And as you can see, the, the results are reasonable. Uh, it seems to make, uh, our prediction seems to make a good distinction between hot and cold sites. Um, the only real failure is this point 20, I would say, where we missed the, the hot zone completely. The, uh, the green uh, boxes are the extra field, uh, and we did not train on it, although we tried that too. Uh, but we used the, uh, the network trained on site A, let's call it, and then try to predict site B. But this does not work at all. And the uh, explanation is that training this network uh, allows it to separate the geological features of that particular site from the temperature. So it does not work if the geological features are not constant. And we believe this also explains uh, why some of, some of these uh, reconstructions fail. This is the result from the larger side. We have 40 holes here. 
And well, I want, I don't have time to go over it in detail, but you see there is some successes. Most of them are successes, I would say, but there are also some failures as well, which are uh, probably due to unexpected geological features at that particular location, which prevents the separation of temperature and electromagnetic data to work well. So what can we learn? learned from this? Well, we believe that these results are very encouraging. And for since there is uh, potential very high economic impact in getting this to work, uh, we are encouraged to pursue this further and improve it. You notice that the three foreign wells fails. So that supports the whole idea behind this, that we should have fairly constant geology for this approach to work and be able to separate temperature from geological features. Uh, local variations in ground conditions, even on one side, therefore, tend to spoil the results. So this is a problem that could be solved if we could somehow inject these extra geological features in our learning process. So that means that our neural network should get more than just our radar data. It should also uh, get geological data in some form. How to do this exactly is unclear, but uh, we are working on this. Finally, uh, some people may wonder how is it possible to get electromagnetic uh, waves to penetrate to uh, like 300 meter and come back and carry data? Well, uh, there are several explanations. The first is that uh, our frequencies are very low. So our intuition that's based on conventional CPR is not really applicable here. Second is that it's probably not necessary for the electromagnetic waves to go all the way to the end of the hot zone because the structure of the beginning of the hot zone may al already give enough information to successfully extrapolate the rest of the zone. So it's unclear to which depth we actually have to get uh, good electromagnetic returns. Another complication here is that the, the wavelength of the wave packets we're using is of the same order of magnitude as the actual depth we're looking at. So we cannot really ever see particular localized reflections. The data is much more complicated. Another reason to use machine learning. Too complicated for humans. Um, and finally, an, an analogy might or might not be appropriate. Uh, at some point, um, Radar scans from airplanes seem to penetrate salt water, namely uh, uh, sea, seabed. And see the, the bed, uh, the seabed, uh, say 30, 30 meters under the surface. So how is that possible? Uh, these were conventional high frequency GPR waves. Well, the explanation that's generally thought to be correct is that the uh, the, the, the seabed generates through, uh, uh, through currents a virtual image of itself on the surface. And that's what we're seeing. So it's like a, a hologram of the seabed is reflected on the surface. And something similar could be going on here uh, on geological features uh, and on temperature features. They could affect uh, the shallower region in a way that reflects and can be decoded into the actual temperature model. However, uh, more research is required to settle questions like this. Thank you for your attention. Um, if you have any questions or inquiries, feel free to send us an email. Thank you.